Welcome to the Watering Hole Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Riemann. The Watering Hole is a place to come and quench your thirst for meaning, nourish your hunger for inspiration, and feed your need for connection. Featuring inspirational talks, curious conversations, mystical meditations, and other artistic expressions exploring themes on life, spirituality, nature, mystery, and so much more. So meet me at the watering hole, and together, let's drink from deep waters. It seems to me that we come into the world sort of ripe for growth, primed for growth, right? We come in looking for love, looking to be nurtured, looking for nourishment. So we're primed for growth. But it's not long before the perceptions, the beliefs of our parents are imprinted on us. In fact, there's evidence that those beliefs are in, in, that those beliefs impact us in utero. Right? Because if you're in utero, you have an experience of life. I mean, there's an experience there. And whether or not that is a, an experience of a place where you are warm and welcome and taken care of often depends on the psychological and emotional state of the parents, of the mother specifically. If she's in a a flight uh, or fear place, her hormones are different and they impact the growth of the child. I'm not a biologist, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a Scientologist, and I'm I'm not a scientist, but it does seem to me that we come into the world and pretty soon we're no longer blank slates, that we're born into a family that has certain beliefs and dynamics that we aren't even told are there. We just learn that they're there by the behavior, by the behavior of our family, of our parents, and then our reaction to that and the feedback we get from those interactions, right? And then we go to school and we get imprinted with the values and beliefs of the education system. If you're in a religious school, then the religious beliefs come into play. Same with at home. If your family is religious, right, you're born into these beliefs and you don't recognize or probably even know that you can question them until much later in life. And then we graduate from school and we go to the job and the corporate culture has expectations of us. And we know we get rewarded when we play along with the game that is expected of us in the corporate culture. And all these systems and institutions reinforce values and beliefs that we, when we come into the world, we are taught just to accept as real, as this is the way the world is. This is the way life is. Complicating matters is the fact that our intellectual and social development happens in a culture that perpetuates the belief that achievement equals worth. And we start early, right? We start, come on, little kid, you got to, you know, you got to be potty trained. And right, we want that kid to be potty trained because we don't want him growing up and crapping, uh, you know, when we're sitting here talking. <laughs> right? We want, we want him to learn that, right? And then we send them to school. And they're taught to sit there. And they're taught that this is history and that this is science, and this is math, and these are the tools that you need to achieve. And if you play by the rules that your school sets up and you're a good girl or a good boy, then you make it through and you get rewarded all the way along. And then you get to your job and the same system is set in place, and by the time you're my age, you're like, what the hell? That's what this is about? That's what this is about? We learn that if we go along 
with the rules and the beliefs that our family, our culture, uh, the institutions we're a part of, if we go along with them, everything will be just fine. Just fine. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be just fine. I want to be alive. I want to be expanding. I want to be in a place of growth. And we have lots of beliefs along the way that tell us, nah, just do everything the way it's always been done, and that'll be fine. Just fine. I don't know about you, but look around. I don't think everything is just fine. And it's definitely, I don't think, in a place of growth. We're in a place of fear right now. You know? And so often when we're in a place of fear, we, what do we want to do? We want to stay where it's comfortable. I love this woman. Her name was Grace Hopper. She was one of the first female rear admirals of the Navy, one of the first computer scientists in the Navy. And she says, the most damaging phrase in the language is, it's always been done that way. She said, humans are allergic to change. That's why they love to say it's always been done that way. She said, I try to fight that. That's why I have a clock on my wall that runs counterclockwise. I love that. I want one of those. I want one of those. When are we told or encouraged to question our perception? When? Maybe you were. And if you were, consider yourself lucky. I wasn't. I was born into a family where I was told not to question my mom, and there were horrible consequences if you did. I was told not to question the priests or the nuns or the teachers at my school. I was told not to question the police or anyone in authority, and anyone in authority was pretty much anyone who was older than me. Right? So when are we told to question our perceptions? Our beliefs. When? Scientists have discovered that our perception actually impacts our environment and vice versa, right? So that creature and environment evolve together. If you take a cell out of its environment and put it in a petri dish, it doesn't do anything. If you put it in an environment where there are positive or negative influences, it responds. And what scientists have told us about cells is that if you put a cell in an environment that is growth-oriented, it moves towards it, it embraces it, it's receptive to it. If you put it in an environment that is negative, that is uh, fear-inducing, it goes away from it, it tries to get away from it, fight or flight, right? Our cells, we, you and I, are organisms, a community of cells is happening in here, right? 70 million or something like that, cells. I don't really remember where I got that number. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, do it, do it, question it. Um, but nonetheless, we are a community of cells. And so if our cells are in a state of fear, of protection, we are in a state of fear and protection. And if our cells are in a state of growth and receptivity, we are in a state of growth and receptivity. And scientists have said that a cell cannot be in both states at one time. You're either in one state or the other. You're not in both at the same time. So one overrides the other. I think the same is true for us. Think about it in your own life. When you're in a state of growth, what do you do? When you're in a safe place and you know that you can explore and be curious and, and question everything, what do you do? Compared to when you're in a place where you feel judged, or you feel like if you speak your truth, you're going to be ridiculed. Or if you do X, Y, and Z, it's going to not be enough or whatever, whatever. What do you do? We retract, we withdraw, we protect ourselves. I don't know about you, but I really believe that we are in a culture, a fear culture right now. 
You know, I turned on my email last week. This is no lie. This is this was the the bold subject line in my in in my emails. Mary, the bees are dying. All caps exclamation point. Yeah. Next one. You've been lied to, Mary. All caps exclamation point. Next one. We're in a fight. All caps exclamation point. And then there's the news, the constant messages that we can't trust each other, that differences are to be feared, and so we have to protect our borders, buy our guns, and move out of our neighborhoods. We get the message that the world isn't safe and is actually against us. We're fed these messages so consistently in subtle and not so subtle ways throughout our development that we don't even realize we're looking at life through an artificial lens. It's almost as if contact lenses were put on our pupils and we don't even know it because they were there before we became conscious of it. Because these beliefs because of these beliefs, we have imposed superficial boundaries everywhere. And then we protect those boundaries as if they are real, often without ever questioning them. And now we live in a world that reflects these beliefs. We are a world of individuals, whether people or nations, Competing for finite resources driven by a belief that me and mine are more important than you and yours, or at least more deserving. Because the lottery of where we were born or what family we were born into or religious tradition we inherited or material wealth we inherited. Without the encouragement and ability to question our perception, without the ability to question what is true, what is real. We become ignorant of the context presented to us. We accept it as reality. And then we become victims of a worldview that we've inherited, not that we've created, not that we've chosen, but that we've inherited. It's time to challenge these perceptions. I love this quote. It's a little long by Bruce Lipton, but I'm going to read it. He says, we're going to have to come together and realize that the evolution that we're facing is not the evolution of the human being. That happened 200,000 years ago. We are already evolved. The evolution that is in front of us is the evolution of something greater called humanity. What that means is and he's referring back to a talk he gave, as you remember when we talked about the human body is 50 trillion cells. He's a scientist, a biologist, a cell biologist. And he said 50 trillion cells coming together to make a human unit called the human being. And now we have 7 billion human being-like cells in a body called humanity. So our evolution is all humans recognizing we're all part of one super organism. When the cells fight each other in your human body, we call that autoimmune disease. Well, right now, humanity is suffering from autoimmune disease because we're killing each other and not recognizing we're all one organism. Consider this next to what Richard Dawkins is putting out. He says, much as we might want to believe otherwise, universal love and welfare of the species as a whole are concepts which simply do not make evolutionary sense. Oh my God. What? What? He's asking us to look at nature and say, there's no harmony. He's asking us to look at the multitudes of diversity of species that do actually live well together. Take the ocean, for example, and say, nah, 
We can't all survive here together. It's competition or nothing. Bullshit. We have to stop believing that. And we believe it on a subconscious level or things would look different out there. They would look different. They would be different. Because our perceptions, our beliefs, influence our behavior. There's not a separation there. So I like this. If humans were to model the lifestyle displayed by a healthy community of cells, our societies and our planet would be more peaceful and vital. We come here because we say we are one. And that is a belief that we are trying to make real. Creation spirituality says we are co-creators of this reality, not victims. We're not victims of this reality. We participate in creating it, and it is time that you and I begin to really weed out those subconscious beliefs that keep us separate. And they start internally, right? They start early on. They start with those messages we get that we're not enough, that we're lazy, that blah, blah, all those negative things that we actually believe about ourselves long before we're six years old. And so how do we get to those beliefs? How do we begin to start really rooting them out and looking at them? Part of it is mindfulness, right? Being mindful of what those beliefs are and when we give those beliefs energy. And taking time to really pay attention to what's happening in our minds. Because that is the perception that we are projecting out into life, into reality. I mean, think about it. If you wake up every day, and this is me. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. This is me. I, and this is a habit of perception. This is why I'm talking about this. I have... I, I often describe myself as somebody who has struggled with depression for most of my life, and that there that's true for me. But in the mornings now, I have to really fight that perception, right? Because I wake up and I have the feeling of, ugh, it's no words. It's just a subtle, ugh, you know? Sometimes it's bigger, and sometimes it's like, ugh, you know? And some, some days, and some, some days it, it convinces me to stay in bed, right? But it's a perception. And it's a habit of perception that I have lived over and over and over again. I'm not saying it's easy to overcome it. But we can. I do one little thing now, and it helps. I wiggle my toes before I get out of bed. And just wiggle your toes. I mean, it's kind of hard to be in a swimming mood when you wiggle your toes. It's like, oh, oh, I, I'm alive. Oh, you know. We've got to, when those thoughts start coming in, we've got to start saying to ourselves, sort of like a computer, cancel. Cancel that out. Is that true or is that my perception of how things are going? Because if I, if I go into my day feeling that dread, what's going to happen? It's probably going to be dreadful. I'm often pleasantly surprised. (laughs) But it would help. I think it can help us if we begin to check those perceptions. Our habits of perception become our subconscious beliefs. And our subconscious beliefs are the thing that drives us. You know, scientists tell us that we actually have two minds, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind handles all of our, like, systems, our digestive system, how our blood flows, our heart beats. We're not conscious of that. We're not making conscious decisions about those things, right? They're happening. The subconscious mind, they say, runs about 95% of our lives. The conscious mind, the mind that's, that's geared, that's primed for growth, for curiosity, for receptivity, is about 5%. That's why mindful, that's why the Buddhists 
practice mindfulness. They're trying to get us to be in our conscious mind more, to be awake right here, right now. So if we never get to the subconscious mind, we never get to those thoughts that are driving our perception, then it's just going to continue because it's 95% of the way we do things. So if we're experiencing fear, we're just going to continue with the habit of the way we've always encountered fear unless we begin to challenge our perception of what is true. In the mornings, I, my wiggling my toes is a way I challenge my perception of what is true. Am I alive or am I dead? You know? Am I really alive? Am I really going to be present or not? So check for yourself. Our bodies give us great biofeedback if we tune in. They tell us, they can tell us where our subconscious mind is spending its time if we tune in. But we've got to slow down. We've got to tune in. We've got to listen to what's happening. Pay attention. Einstein said, the biggest decision you'll ever have to make is to decide once and for all whether you live in a universe that is supportive and friendly or hostile and non-supportive. He doesn't say the biggest uh, fact you have to discern is whether the universe is supportive or not. He says that you have to decide. We get to decide our perception of how life unfolds. It doesn't mean there's not pain if we say we live in a supportive environment. It simply recognizes that death is part of life, that pain is part of being alive. It doesn't get us out of it. But I'd much rather live in a supportive, friendly environment than one that's hostile and non-supportive. And if I have to make a decision about it, I know which way I want to go. But I think we all have to make that decision. Because right now, we're living in a shared reality that says the world is hostile and non-supportive. And our behaviors, our thoughts and behaviors are reinforcing that belief, that perception. And so it's becoming reality. We come here to turn up the vibration on a supportive loving universe to say in in spite of what is being presented to me what the world is presenting to me i believe that we are one what if we really began to challenge this perception alan watts is one of my favorites right now says that the universe is basically playful there's no necessity for this universe whatsoever. It isn't going anywhere. It doesn't have a destination that it ought to arrive at, but it is best understood by an analogy with music because music as an art form is essentially playful. You don't say you're going to go home and work the piano or I'm going to get out my guitar and work it. We play it. What if we played with life a little more? Part of this shared reality is that we say that words are truth and that limits our perception it totally limits our perception if we believe if we take ourselves so seriously as to say that what i'm saying is actually what i mean all of life is translation so we should lighten up with our language a little bit so that we can play more easily so that we can be more receptive to what is real for better or for worse we influence the earth more than any other species more often than not it appears that our historical influence has been largely destructive our survival and the survival of countless species now hinges on making changes in consciousness that will end this cycle of hostility. 
We have to address the habits of perception that lie at the root of destructive human behavior and access present moment awareness, the conscious mind, so that we can come wholly into this creative realm, wholly with our mind, our body, our spirit, with our heart, with eagerness, with willingness, with receptivity. I believe that we are on the threshold of a breakthrough which evolution has long been preparing for. Collectively, I think that breakthrough is humanity recognizing itself as cells in one organism. Clearly, we're not there yet, right? It still lies ahead. Individually, though, that breakthrough begins the moment we begin to question our perception, challenge our belief, change our behaviors, and raise our eyes above history's illusory divisions. Curiosity is extremely important right now. Really diving in to what beliefs are running us. Otherwise, we will continue to do what's always been done. And I'm afraid we're doing that. So I say, let's do something different. Thanks for listening, everybody. I look forward to meeting you right back here at the watering hole. And as Mary Oliver said, go easy, be filled with light, and shine.